yeah, if we have right, a couple right. more people joining. And then, um, as uh, Olivier uh, mentioned already, uh, we'll record the event as well. Uh, so that way, the, those folks yeah, who are already time. on their Easter break, um, <laughs> they'll have a chance to, uh, to watch it on another occasion. Stefan, you give me a sign, yes? Yeah, Molly will, will take the, the lead. Oh, there. Molly, Molly, yeah. sign. Then we wait a couple more minutes uh, just to see if a couple more people will join oh, us and then we can get started. Oh, okay. Uh, Cornelia, would you like to say some words before um, before Takis and Bob speak? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great then. So a short introduction. Yeah. Perfect. Do you think? Shall I start? Fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> so then let's start, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues. I'm really happy to welcome you to our Climate Roundtable before Easter. And we as a left group invite you to our discussion on a very important uh, topic, energy communities fighting energy poverty. And first we have to find out this topic is really increasing, especially in the COVID-19 time, calculated uh, conservatively, at least 15 million people suffered from energy poverty before the pandemic and COVID-19 pandemic made energy poverty really worse. And people suffering from respiratory diseases as a result of living in cold homes face a higher risk from COVID-19. And I know some people uh, in this situation in my, my home uh, uh, town in uh, Dresden. People suffer from higher energy costs due to lockdowns and work in home office and companies are already promoting hybrid work after the pandemic. As a consequence, access to energy is increasingly becoming a condition for participation in cultural, social and economic life. The pressure on energy poor households will further increase and many countries, and this is really good, introduce temporary measures to reduce energy poverty, for example, by banning disconnections, but most, but most have a sunset clause and will be discontinued after the pandemic. This we have to discuss. And a second point. Beyond the pandemic, we face a still greater challenge of climatic change, and we need to have a social and an ecological transition, also as a part of uh, the COVID-19 recovery. What do I mean? I mean, the transformation of the energy system is crucial, and this poses dangers this poses dangers, but also opportunities to fight energy poverty by improving energy efficiency, by improving energy uh, efficiency and empowering local communities to produce affordable energy for all. The big problem is, and this is a problem what we have to discuss, governments in the EU withdraw from their task of providing essential public services. As a result, energy communities step in. But in other words, it's not fair to place this burden on private citizens citizens and uh, governments and municipalities need to take more responsibility. Energy supply must be returned to the public first. But it's also important for municipalities and public authorities to work together with citizen energy cooperatives to fight energy poverty by creating synergies and mutually supporting efforts to empower local communities and include people in community energy projects who rent and do not own their own homes. Wind and solar power but power plants are smaller and can be installed in a, a decentralized manner, which uh, lend itself to energy cooperatives and energy communities. In order to tackle climate change, we need to tackle <coughs> environmental concerns and questions of social justice together, and social consideration must play a much stronger role in the environmental and energy policies. 
I will shadow in um, the, uh, of the EP initiative report on energy system integration. And this report highlighted, and this was okay, that energy communities have an important role to play in the transformation of the energy system. And in addressing social issues such as energy poverty. We say energy policy must also be social policy. And energy communities are important drivers for tackling the green transition and addressing energy poverty by bringing together engaged citizens and public authorities. The relation between uh, energy cooperatives and public uh, authorities should follow the principle of an energy system that is as decentralized as possible and as centralized as necessary. Yes, and my last point, which policies are needed to fight energy poverty? I think it's time that the EU and member states take steps to put an end to energy poverty with legislative measures and other similar <clears throat> measures. Very short, then on disconnection, price control, increasing wages. This is very important to have a higher minimum wages. And uh, by promoting collective bargaining, tax relief through home office due to higher electricity costs, providing uh, affordable uh, energy efficient home and implement free of charge renovations for tenants, especially energy poor households need more and better social housing. Big, big, big problem in Germany. Re-municipalization and providing affordable, high quality public services. And last but not least, a European definition of energy poverty. We don't have. Energy communities should not replace these measures, but they can contribute to fighting energy poverty in different ways and help to empower local communities on many, many different levels. Therefore, I'm happy that we have this roundtable, and I think uh, our guests uh, can uh, show us good practices, examples uh, of what energy communities are capable for to fight, uh, of to fight energy poverty. And uh, yeah, now <laughs> I can give the floor Molly, Molly Walsh, uh, and um, let me say some words uh, to Molly from Friends of the Earth Europe. Uh, Molly, let me say this meeting, in this meeting, to thank you for all your support in the last years. It was very, very important for us. And uh, I hope we will have a wonderful cooperation also in the next years and not only in this, uh, in this um, round table. Uh, we all <laughs> need your spirit and we need the spirit of many NGOs and activists uh, for our work in the European Parliament. And that's why I'm proud you are here and can moderate. I give you the floor, Molly. <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank, Cornelia. Always a, a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and yeah, great work that we know we can always trust when you have your eye on a file that uh, the communities will be supported properly in there. Um, so yeah, um, my name is Molly Walsh and I work for Friends of the Earth Europe um, in Brussels. Um, so yeah, I'm an advocate for speeding up the development of community renewables across Europe. Um, and I've been doing this since 2013 uh, in Brussels. So uh, yeah, I've been around the block now. Um, and we often hear um, the uh, it's said about energy communities or energy cooperatives that that's only a middle class solution mm. or that that's a way for rich people to get richer. Um, well, in all my years working on it, that's not the kind of projects that I work with. I don't know where these uh, um, cooperatives who are getting super rich are, but I haven't met them. Um, the projects that I work with are um, people who come together for the common good. Um, they want to cooperate and collaborate to make things better for, for reasons of climate protection, um, but also for reasons of social justice, for a sense of pride in their community. Um, and many community energy projects have genuinely redistributive goals. Um, they're really trying to take the energy system away from the profit-driven commodity world and bring it into something where energy is seen as a common good. 
of course, uh, as Connie said, this shouldn't be something addressing energy poverty and addressing inequality in general. It shouldn't be left only to these community energy actors, as powerful as they are. Um, but it is something where, uh, in different ways ac across Europe, different community projects have shown great innovation in tackling energy poverty. Um, and here we'll, two, it, we'll hear about two of those projects here today. Um, two of my favorite projects for tackling energy poverty. Um, so first I would like to give, to give the floor to Bob um, from ECLO. Um, ECLO is a, apparently a medium-sized city. Um, from Ireland, it would be considered a, a big town uh, in Belgium, not very far from, from where we are in Brussels. Um, and they've been doing some really innovative things, working both with the cooperative um, and with the municipality there. So Bob, uh, I'll hand over to you for, for 10 minutes. All right. Super. Um, thank you, Molly. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me, Cornelia. Um, I'm just going to share my, my screen and my presentation. Is it visible at the moment? Yes, we see it. Yes. All right. Good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to start with, by, by asking if you've ever considered um, that up to seven generations ago, all energy used to be local. And it's not a question of going back, but it's just to acknowledge that for thousands of generations, there was some sort of organic symbiosis between humans and their surroundings. And I like to call this like uh, Darwin's energy because uh, throughout his history, we became more and more successful in shaping our landscape and harvesting energy. And uh, we did that. Oh. Uh. Uh -huh, okay. And we've became more and more successful in this um, from 5000 kilocalories a day to 8000 and until we reach this organic ceiling and we've already reached that in the Roman er uh, period of 30,000 kilocalories a day um, and throughout the history, this was the, the, the top of what we could produce or get from our surroundings until seven generations ago, we discovered oil. And um, in only seven generations, uh, the possibilities like exploded uh, and the scale of energy went from geographically from a local commodity to a global commodity and historically from um, a regeneration cycle of one year or several years to several millions of years. And that's very important to keep in mind because it is in this period and on these places exactly that democracy evolved. So um, the link of uh, between energy and democracy, to my account, is more fundamental that even now is uh, acknowledged within uh, the cooperative society. Because um, the transition towards uh, renewable energy might be more uh, important than just on the climate uh, issue. So the question is, um, if the, 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 for the next transition, um, in what way can we structure this, uh, this, this uh, shift to renewables while safeguarding our democra democratic values? And, uh, but because if you take a look at um, what we are paying at the moment for the import of fossil fuels, the, um, the whole, the European Union is paying 1 billion euro a day uh, Belgium, one, uh, 20 billion euros a year, and my even my small city of 20,000 inhabitants is paying 40 million a year for the uh, for the use of their fossil fuels. And if you take into account that the average wage in Belgium is 2,000 uh, per person, um, that means that we are all uh, on average working 10 time uh, 10 days a year full time for the saudis and the russians um but if you would uh, translate this to the lowest um the uh, the, the lowest wage per, uh, uh quintile uh this already mounts up to 20 days and if you take into account that these the, the trend is that energy costs are rising and the, the, the subsidies to get to renewals are only reaching the, the higher incomes, I can really understand why people are getting frustrated with this energy transition and why people are taking on this, uh, this, their uh, yellow jackets. In ECLO, we, we 
20 years, some 20 years ago, we started with a, a public tender, um, which allowed three cooperative wind turbines to be built. And one of the things we did is we uh, we didn't only went for the criterion of price, but we added quality participation and uh, information and an information campaign. Uh, EcoPower came out as uh, the victor of this uh, public tender, and they built three wind turbines without any um, opposition, without any objection from the the neighborhood. In the course of the years. Five were added again without any um, any issue um, until around 2008. We saw the democratic support drop, and with the dramatic, the, so we had to do something about that. And what we did is we made up a, um, a, a closed end scenario where we we told the people like this is the the maximum turbines that would be built here in our city and this is the place where they will be built and nowhere else so we we went for a spatial plan uh, with a concentration zone and an exclusion zone and we went to the people in this concentration zone and asked them not if they were in favor or against wind turbines we asked them what it would take for them not to pursue uh, legal means uh, if uh, building applications were submitted. We agreed with uh, the neighbors, with uh, also with uh, the, 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 the wind companies or the energy companies and with the city and with the province, provincial level that uh, there would be uh, that on a uh, democratic support model. This democratic support model has um, four main points. It said uh, on the input side, 25% of all turbines should be opened up for direct citizen participation. 25% should be opened up for participation by the city. And on the output side, 5,000 euros per year to uh, would go to a climate fund and 5,000 per year for the neighbor or for a neighborhood fund. And this ended up by uh, allowing on top of the eight turbines that were already in place, uh, 14 more to be permitted in 2017, uh, leading up to uh, next year, uh, last year, um, our total need as the, the figures say, but as, sorry, it's in Dutch, but uh, as the, the figures here show that uh, our total electricity production was already 130% uh, of our uh, total energy need. So we are actually exporting uh, green renewable energy electricity at the moment. But may, maybe even more important and uh, more interesting is that is the economic return of this democratic support model. These are the numbers of uh, what normally a landowner and an energy company are making uh, for every turbine um, on average. Um, if you if we would use our or if we would copy that to our e claw model you show that uh, it shows that the energy company is still making uh, a lot of money they're still making profit this is without uh, the, um, uh, the the investition uh, the uh, the investment cost this is uh, just clear profit 125000 euros each year um, and if you would multiply this with the 14 turbines that were permitted, if you would multiply this by the 20 years of um, uh, a building permit is actually uh, valid, uh, you come up with a, a decent sum of money you could, uh, uh, of, of capital added value, I, I, sh I need to say added value, you could keep local in inside of your community. And the idea is that we're, we would do uh, yeah, a lot of fun stuff with that because uh, you could like for instance the the it would be a very interesting idea that the the, adapt, the climate adaptation measures could be used uh, or could be paid by uh, what's the energy uh, sector is or the energy transition uh, the energy sorry um, the, yeah the energy transition is making um with a rolling fund with um with reforestation projects and programs uh, everything that is uh, fundamentally well, um, impossible to fund on a direct way like uh, the, the possibilities the energy sector has. But what's most important and most inter in interesting and most challenging um, point 
that we are facing at the moment is that um, we want to use this uh, these 25% uh, shares of the, the democratic support model to uh, go for the, a debt relief program. And if you, um, it, so instead of giving social premiums to uh, people in poverty, uh, what if we would just like rent lease cooperative shares? Um, first of all, it would activate and include people in poverty with the energy transition. While social premiums currently are supporting mostly uh, cheap nuclear profits, um, these shares would keep the added value of local green um, electricity in the community. And most important, um, as the Flemish independent regulator calculated, that the difference on the annual electricity bill can get up to as much as 200 euros. This could be used as a form of, this could even be used as a form of debt relief, direct profits uh, to people in poverty, or even have them pay off the share in time if they, if, uh, if they could um, if they could afford it, if all debts are relieved. So um, we have those um, those shares at our disposal. So if we would distribute them to uh, the 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 the, uh, the public or the, the the people in poverty who are not um, uh, equipped to buy shares, I think you have the missing piece, the missing link to make sure that the energy energy transition is not uh, a middle class story and uh, is opening opened up for uh, all people and for the, the whole community. And by that, like rejoining the, the green jackets and the yellow jackets. So I would conclude with, with by saying like ECRO is not special. Uh, we still don't have an energy budget. We only have one part-time employee and we are a city of uh, 20,000 inhabitants um, of uh, older people, conservative people, poorer people. Um, so not the usual suspects you would go for a really progressive uh, energy transition uh, narrative. But by making this the, the, the whole uh, transition narrative, um, not elusive about CO2, but very concrete, very tangible on uh, in energy bills, in reforestation, in re-greening urban area projects. Uh, this is the way how to um, get this across to local communities. And I think there's the, the key. What we are doing is actually not, nothing special, if you, you ask me. Uh, we just build up a new story around the energy transition. So I hope this can inspire a lot of people to uh, join us or, um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, and I think it is really inspiring, uh, mostly because you say, um, yeah, that ECLO isn't special, <laughs> uh, even though in some ways it is because uh, it, it could happen everywhere. Uh, it, it could have this could happen anywhere and um yeah what a what a great way to not only get people out of energy poverty but then also give them a stake in the energy transition as well once they have shares in that cooperative um and they have ownership in those turbines that they can see uh, that's what i always like about that story um I'd like to hand right over to Takis, um, who is an energy campaigner in Greenpeace in Greece and who has been fighting uh, the good fight for a long time now, um, and who will explain about virtual net metering and how virtual net metering can be used uh, uh, to fight energy poverty. Thank you, Molly. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. I have four or five slides. Everybody can see? Great. Yeah. So thank you very much, um, Cornelia Ernst, for the invitation. It's with great pleasure that I come here to share some of, some of our experiences with um, energy communities, virtual net metering and fighting energy poverty, social solar, as we like to call it. Um, I was asked to present the Thessaloniki project where we donated a 10 kilowatt um, photovoltaic. That's the picture on the left, as you can see. Um, in fact, we did another one with Larissa City, another city the following year. So these are the two pictures here, you can see. Both of them using virtual net metering. Now, maybe I should have added a slide um, explaining what virtual net metering is, but I'll just go quickly in words. 
First of all, net metering. Net metering is when you have a PV panel on your rooftop, in your house, and whatever it produces, you don't sell it to the grid, rather it's been deducted by your electricity consumption. So it's not technical, it's not a sale, but you net meter, you self-consume whatever energy is produced. Now, virtual net metering is practically the same, only you don't have to have the panels on your rooftop because you don't have space or you don't own your house. So the PV system can be situated elsewhere. And whatever power it produces, you don't sell it, but virtually, logistically, it's been deducted from your uh, consumption meter. So this project in Thessaloniki, to the left, it's a 10 kilowatt system and all the power it's producing, it's gonna be deducted from a um, municipal service called Shelter for Victims of Domestic Violence, which houses usually women, women and their children that are victims of uh, domestic violence. And the um, system on the right, on the Larissa city, again, with the cooperation of the um, local municipality there, we paid for the system in an agreement that the municipality, as, in, as with Thessaloniki, are gonna do more uh, similar projects. The system there provides power to, child care, to a childcare facility in the city. Both the childcare facility in Larissa and the municipal shelter for victims in Thessaloniki that don't have rooftop space. So it was impossible to make these buildings energy dependent. So we used the space in the schools. And if you take a good look at the pictures, you see how much, I mean, this is just a lighthouse project, as we call it, a pilot project, just to um, familiarize the people with this new novel idea that you can actually have your PV panel somewhere else, in a PV park or in another rooftop, in another building. But as you can see, how much empty space there is, rooftop space in the schools, and how we can actually utilize this. And I would like to show you this, um, this picture here where we have analyzed how much PVs can, you can actually put into the um, rooftops of the school. Now, mind you, school buildings usually have a lower consumption profile. And if you actually retrofit those buildings and you make them even more efficient, then you, you have plenty of space to actually be able to install PVs and distribute this power around. So it looks like this. I mean, I have put different colors in different PV clusters. So the top, um, the blue PVs, it's around 26 kilowatts that can go to power the, um, the consumption of the school. So the municipality or the local government that owns the school can put different PV panels to cover different consumption needs of other buildings that they don't have adequate rooftop space. However, take a look at the little red box to the left. And this is where it gets interesting. Using the, this visual net metering law, they can actually power not just their own municipal buildings, but give this power to a third party, meaning actually vulnerable households. So with around 27 kilowatts, you can actually give a good amount of help, provide a good amount of help to 12 to 15 vulnerable households. And that's a novel, it's a nice idea. And actually, if you consider what we're doing now, I mean, usually we try to help vulnerable households. The social policy is you um, substitute, you, we subsidize their consumption, which is not very smart if you think about it. First of all, you, because this consumption subsidy uh, ends up being supporting the current energy model. Actually, it's, it's a subsidy to fossil fuels and nuclear energy, if you think about it. And second, you don't really help those households. It's like, yes, you do hold the lifeline to them, but they need to stay attached to this, li this lifeline in the next year, in the following year, and the following year. You don't actually change systemically the way they live. So other things being equal, they have no means of escaping this energy poverty. They still need your help that you're gonna give them next year and the next year. That has, this has the characteristics of philanthropy. What we should be doing instead is give these people the power to produce their own energy, their own clean energy. Be able to stand on their feet, get their dignity back, and you know what? Become part of the new era. You know, make sure that what we're trying to achieve, the new era, you know, it's inclusive, doesn't leave anyone behind. So that's all philanthropy, that's solidarity. And if you think about it, it's quite awesome really. And this is an idea, I mean, 
this idea we're not really about to reinvent the wheel. It, it, the past four or five years, we have seen similar initiatives where social policy stops con, um, providing subsidies to vulnerable households, but rather they make them prosumers. And we have seen several projects, similar projects popping up around the world, actually mainly in Australia, in a lot of progressive USA states. For example, it can be a single family system like this happy gentleman here in the picture in San Francisco or multi-housing systems um, in Colombia, uh, in California or community solar parks in Colorado. All these are social solar projects or low income um, solar projects. And most of these projects use some kind of power sharing or virtual net metering scheme exactly to ensure that this power, that, uh, sorry, the recipients, the beneficiaries, the vulnerable households will have access to this power. And as Greenpeace, what we're trying to do, except from, for having lighthouse projects, the idea is to do some policy lobbying. And to that end, we produced a report and we explained, we analyzed and we analyzed the cost and the methodology behind it, making 340,000 vulnerable households prosumers, either by installing PV directly to them for free as part of social policy or giving them, giving, give them shares in an energy community uh, solar park, actually using virtual net metering to, become, to make them independent. And that number was not picked by accident. Actually, according to official uh, public data, 340,000 vulnerable households in Greece right now are having trouble paying their electricity bills, even though they're under a consumption subsidy scheme. And we found out that actually over a 10 year period, it makes much more economic sense to build the solar plants all over Greece. And through virtual net metering, give those people free solar power, then actually keep paying them every year for the, um, for the consumption. Now, what we have achieved since then, obviously, I mean, the government hasn't done this already. This is how things usually work. You start pressuring the government, you do projects and you do reports and you start lobbying. So what we have achieved so far is either having private initiatives like the Hyperion Solar Community, which is the very first um, virtual net metering project in Athens. Mind you, Athens is a very congested city, very packed urban area. Almost half the population of Greece lives in Athens. So Hyperion is the first solar community using virtual net metering in Greece. It will start with 30 families, some social enterprises and some NGOs. But in the second phase of development, hopefully in a couple of years, it's gonna include more than 200 families that's gonna, that gonna buy shares, but also a certain amount of this power that will be produced from the solar park that's gonna be installed outside Athens. Most of this power, a lot of this power is gonna go to vulnerable households as a kind of social policy. And also right now, as we speak, we have plans being, pub, being announced either from energy communities or municipalities um, that they involve thousands of um, poor families being the recipients of free solar power through some kind of virtual net metering scheme. Now, obviously, it shouldn't be the responsibility of private initiatives and even municipalities, I would argue, to have a proper social policy. It's the responsibility of the central government, as Cornelia Ernst so right, right, rightly pointed out. But still, I believe we're getting there. And, and it's nice to see these initiatives and some municipalities showing us the way. So to conclude, <clears throat> virtual net metering is a key tool in promoting energy democracy and especially in, a, in help, help us eradicate energy poverty. And there is a problem here. I mean, the European Commission's slogan, clean energy for all Europeans, there are some problems with that. If we don't uh, ensure that there is access to clean energy, indeed, to all Europeans. You have a very practical problem. According to EU statistics, 40% of Europeans right now live in some kind of multi-apartment building. In fact, where I am from in Greece, that percentage is 60%. 60% of all Greeks live in some multi-apartment building. Now, by default, these people <laughs> they don't have access to producing their own clean power unless you have something like visual net meter. Mm. So this is really crucial. 
I believe that virtual net metering is a key tool in grounding everyone access, but also an awesome and very cool tool to use against energy poverty, exactly doing the same as part of, you know, as part of social policy, grounding access to these people to the means to produce their own energy. And you know where we are right now, actually. I mean, if you look what's happening in the energy sector, you get billions of euros investments in big renewable energy systems by big energy companies. And of course, you have this all this craziness about the green hydrogen, which is more like a wishful thinking actually right now, but it's been used as a Trojan horse, if you like, to justify billions of investment in gas right now. So it looks like we're in, in the danger of going to a pathway that might lead us to 100% renewable energy, but for whom? Mm -hmm. So we'll have to make sure that we're going in a parallel path that ensures public participation, that this energy transition is socially fair and inclusive. So it shouldn't be come as a, as a surprise that visual net metering is under attack. In fact, I don't know if <clears throat> many of you remember what happened three years ago when we were um, fighting over the Renewable Energy Directive to include virtual net metering. We almost lost it. It was almost thrown out of the window, but it stayed inside in the very last minute. So there are a lot of arguments against virtual net metering. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be bothered with most of them. However, there are two arguments that do have some merit. These are fair points that we need to consider because these two are going to be used again in the new Renewable Energy Directive to kick virtual net metering out. The first one is remote production from consumption point. So when you produce somewhere else from where you consume, which is the basic philosophy of virtual net metering, you're actually causing the DSOs, that's the distribution grid operators, a lot of headaches. Th that's an actual problem. They're having trouble managing, matching production somewhere else, say in the countryside with consumption in the city. So it causes them problems, and this is an actual problem. And also, real-time sync of production and consum consumption. Now, we want to move to an era where we have 100% renewable energy. In order to do that, we need to change the philosophy of the energy system. I'm talking on technical terms now. We need to stop using base load power from big lignite coal or uh, nuclear er energy units. And we need to turn to a model that has a more flexible demand. And us as consumers, we should have the right to choose when to consume, when to turn on the washing machine, on, when to you know, turn off another electrical appliance or to install a battery. In order for the grid to do that, it's really important to have real-time sync of production and consumption. Again, virtual net metering might be appear as a problem to this. So these are fair points we need to consider. There are solutions, possible solutions to this, but, and this is to conclude, we need to find a way to make sure in the new Renewable Energy Directive, virtual net metering stays inside. Possibly the, the Renewable Energy Directive should give enough flexibility to the member states to implement, if they like, virtual net metering as they see fit, and maybe ask those member states um, to come up with methodology and certain solutions as to smoothly incorporate virtual net metering into their markets. I do believe, and with that I, I conclude, that virtual net metering is a very, very useful tool, a very awesome tool not to have around if we want to fight for an energy democratic transition of our economies. Now, thank you very much. And before I give, before Molly, before, before uh, I return to you, uh, I would like to share with you all a link. It's a two minute video um, that um, describes the Hyperion project, which is this one that I showed you before. It's a really cool video, two minute video. I think you're gonna find it very interesting, very exciting. And we're proud about Hyperion Solar Community because Greenpeace is also behind it, you know, supporting it. So I'm gonna put a link into the chat and please watch it to, to um, save it, watch it later. So yeah, that's Molly, right. So um, yeah, we we didn't have time for sharing this. So you probably need to stop sharing your screen first before you look for the video. Yeah. So we didn't have time to show this video now, but um, thanks to Takis for putting it in the chat um, and yeah, uh, do open it and, and watch it later. Um, so 
I'd like to go to the floor for questions in a minute. Um, and you can raise a question either by writing in the Q&A or by raising your hand. Um, but first, I have a question for the panelists. Um, and that is, what legislative barriers are you facing uh, with your projects? So are there national level uh, laws or policies that make it more difficult for you to carry out what you're trying to do? I don't know who would like to start. Yeah. Takis, maybe you can say briefly because you were kind of coming to it at the end. Um, we do get a lot of um, barriers and bureaucratic barriers, ba barriers um, from setting up an energy community, which is something novel for Greece. I mean, um, energy cooperatives are in Europe. I mean, we have an experience of decades in other countries in Europe, but in Greece, it's difficult. It's something new. You get a lot of barriers all the way bureaucratics um, to, um, to the tax office, to uh, the registry that you have to apply uh, proper documentation and everything. However, the most difficult was, was with which on admitting. A, like I said, the DSO, the distribution grid operator doesn't really like it. And B, practically, if you go to the, um, the local office of the DSO to apply for a return net metering, <laughs> it's, it, it can really get, uh, I mean, you can get really fun stories there. Just to give you an example, the Thessaloniki return net metering project that I showed you, it was the very first application of return net metering in Greece. We literally went outside the DSO seven o'clock in the morning, uh, a week after the law had been published, waiting for the office to open to submit are folded. All right, so uh, if you look at DSO Greece list, the number one project out of hundreds that followed, the number one is the Greenpeace Thessaloniki municipality. It took us a year to connect the actual PV. That's 12 months a mm. year, even though we're the first. So we do have these problems. However, and I conclude, the most difficult problem is political resistance. There, we can all imagine there are certain interests in place that don't look you know, don't look favorable to be trying to meeting and to energy communities. And this is what we need to take care of, especially now under the new renewable energy directive that's gonna be revised. We need to make sure that we have all the options in our hands if we want to promote just energy transition. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Maybe one important thing to note is that the um, renewable energy directive will be revised, but the provisions related to communities will not be changed. Um, Bob, you want to say a little bit about what legislative barriers you're facing? Yeah, the, the main problem we're facing is that we can't link our democratic support model as a, a binding condition to building permits. So this means that after um, uh, yeah, hand, having handed out the building permits, um, we need to, or we are destined to uh, the goodwill or we are... are uh, handed over to the goodwill of uh, the big energy companies um, to fulfill the, the, their promises they made uh, prior to handing them their building permits. So I see three options, either uh, the, the Flemish or the Bel national government would give us the freedom to, to uh, take these non-spatial conditions or economic conditions and attach them to building permits. Uh, if you look at the track record of uh, how, uh, like in practice, the, the, the community thinks that these conditions matter in handing out the building permit, you could say that, or you could make the argument that they, uh, these economic conditions are spatial by nature because it makes the uh, building permit acceptable for the surrounding. So, uh, but we can't link them at the moment. So either they allow this, either they, um, the, the Flemish government would, have a fix of um, and, uh, or of participation so that for saying for every project 50% need to be opened up for direct citizen participation or the third option is that uh, you have this procedure in Holland in Holland you have like uh, they call it the green button procedure um, so 
in prior to the um, uh, having or uh, being allowed to hand in a building permit application, you need to come to an agreement already signed with contracts, etc., on the div uh, div uh, division of who gets what in uh, in in which project. So these are three options. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, at the moment we are uh, still like left to the the favor of the the, the EDF uh, and NGs of this world. Mm, yeah, not where we want to be. Okay, I see two questions in the Q and A. Um, I would like to take them both and then go back to the panelists, and then we'll move to back to Cornelia for the wrap up. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's see if we can have Jean Claude and also Melanie. Um, and yeah, I just want to remind everyone that this is being recorded um, and live streamed. Um, so yeah, don't say anything that you don't want on the record. <laughs> uh, Jean-Claude, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, yes, certainly. Um, can you hear me? Is it okay? Very well, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure because there was no picture, just my name. <laughs> But uh, I, I put a question down regarding the, the Gilets Jaunes movement that started two and a half years ago. Um, if people remember, it was about energy. It's people who rebelled because of a tax hike in the price of petrol. And these are people who, because of cost issues, are located outside main urban centers. And they have to take their car to go to work because they have no alternative. Uh, there are no means of public transportation quite often from those little villages to urban centers. And my question was really, uh, what can we do to mobilize communities to ask and act for new forms of public transport? Uh, it could be tramway lines, it could be buses, it could be others, so that their issues are addressed. In, in two and a half years, the the Gilets Jaunes are still awaiting for answers to that. And I don't think it's the present government is not going to provide one. But I think it's a matter of organizing these communities so that we, we create a movement from that. So I'd, I'd like to have your, uh, the panelist, uh, not the panelist, the, yes, the panelist views on that. Uh, it's the issue of mobilizing communities for collective action, really. Great, great question. And let's take Melanie's question as well. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for both presentation. That was really interesting and um, to have concrete examples. Um, so we already um, started to answer part of the question about the, the barriers um, to implement such such a model of communities that, that can help um, tackling energy poverty. Uh, but then maybe I would like focusing on the, the solution side. So um, mainly at the European level, what, what solution um, do you see to, to help uh, fostering this, this kind of, of model of, of community? Thank you. Great. So two questions there. The first one, how can we mobilize communities to demand the kind of public services needed, um, especially so that they don't face the burden of um, yeah, tax hikes or face the burden of the energy transition? Um, and the second around what's needed at European level um, to facilitate more uh, community energy participation in, in tackling energy poverty. Uh, Takis, do you want to start? Um, I'll start with the latter. Um, Again, social policy should be the responsibility of the central government. However, we, if, if I understand correctly, the question is how we can mobilize communities <clears throat> in order to do these projects. Um, I think we, we, need, we, need, we need to set up the conditions right so these communities have the tool and be able to subsidize, subsidize to, to provide financial incentives when it's possible for these projects to be able to take place. So you need them to have the legal framework right and to um, give this kind of um, financial incentives when it's possible. Um, but again, I'm not sure if I understand correctly the question, but I think 
what we should be doing is try to make central governments take up the responsibility in providing these social policies. Uh, I, I'm not very comfortable in leaving all this the, oh, the responsibility to private initiatives to tackle energy poverty and promote this kind of projects. There are also like uh, lighthouse projects or they can show the way, but at the end of the day, we all need to fight together to uh, have some things change from, uh, at the central level. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not sure if I, I, I correctly address the question, but that's, that's what I'm thinking right now. Well, great, great. Uh, Bob, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I'll go with the, the question of Jean-Claude um, of uh, how we could um, like engage people or uh, how uh, engage local communities. I think it's it's to show that uh, the profit being made from uh, the, the energy transition can go to people in poverty because this is not happening at the moment. At the moment, if even if you just look at uh, where subsidies are going to, they're going to the higher incomes, the middle class, uh, even uh, the middle class incomes, but not to the lower incomes who are at uh, this moment unable to put solar panels on their own roofs, uh, who are not, uh, un who are unable to uh, detach themselves from the big companies and uh, are still paying profits to these bigger companies. So. Um, it's it's a question of uh, having them um, giving people in poverty the tools to um, work for them or to provide for themselves, which they can't at this moment. And how we could do this is, uh, I think it's um, so. Uh, is to repeat after well now no, let, let me just give you a short example um uh, in the the city next to eclo um when they at the moment that we started our project they had a similar project also with wind turbines but they sold their land to the big company to get got a big bag of money uh they already now have long last spend it, this, this, uh, this, this capital, and nobody remembers what uh, the added value was. Well, we had, um, we rented out our, um, our, our plots of land where the turbines were built, and year after year, we can communicate with the, the, the public that this is the added value they get with a very tangible project. This, the, 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 the profit didn't go or go up into, in the bigger budget, no, it was separated from the bigger budget budget and every year again people are seeing like this is what we are doing with the profit being and the added value being made from uh, the energy transition and this is how you convince people uh, on the long term that the added value of uh, the energy transition can also be made available for them um, and uh, think really carefully that it is about the privatization of public goods of the commons of mm -hmm. wind sun and the landscape so uh, it is for the communities to uh, decide uh, under which under which conditions we will allow this privatization to happen and not vice versa yeah brilliant uh, excellent point to end on yeah i fully agree um and maybe just if i respond briefly to uh, Jean-Claude's point as well. I think um, uh, the Gilets Jaunes proved to me uh, what I already kind of felt, which was that if the energy transition is not fair, then it's not going to happen because there's going to be so much resistance in in many forms. Um, and I hope that that was a wake up call for those in power that you can't force an unfair transition on people. They're going to resist it and then it won't happen or it definitely won't happen fast enough to prevent climate change. Um, I pass back to Cornelia Ernst for the wrap up and final words. Yeah, final words. <laughs> I think final words we, we don't have. But uh, what, what, is, what is our task in the European Parliament? I think we have uh, to lead our view not uh, to the big players uh, in uh, um, not uh, in the big players in the energy market. We have uh, to look in all regulations, what can we do to support uh, the local communities, uh, cooperatives, and how can we uh, support the cooperation between the authorities in the, uh, in the cities and uh, the cooperatives. I think this is very, very important. 
And we have a big debate about a, a great uh, and big player. Uh, I think about, I think, look, it's, it's the gas pipelines. Uh, all people are speaking, and also the members of the European Parliament, uh, a lot of them uh, say we need uh, the big gas pipelines, pipelines in the uh, Mediterranean Sea and uh, in the North Sea, and um, all our power has to go to there. And I think we should make clear that we can do a lot in our communities, a lot in our cities, and a lot in our regions. And uh, we should uh, stimulate this. And this is also a national point. Um, let me say uh, something on uh, uh, Germany. In these days, I read in the um, I read uh, in the newspaper that in Germany we have an additional problem for cooperatives. Um, and it's about the new regulation for which only half of the generated electricity is paid for in solar system for uh, 300 kilowatts. Uh, the rest must uh, be used or sold uh, yourself. And uh, if you look at the prices, very low prices, this is very difficult for uh, these uh, cooperatives. Uh, and we have, what I want to say is, we have also to look at the national level, um, where can we, uh, um, where can we um, support these uh, smaller uh, players and, um, Yes, and we have to discuss um, what is uh, what is with energy. Uh, energy, uh, we need energy as a public uh, good, and uh, uh, we have the de debate in Germany, but also in other uh, countries, uh, that we uh, need it uh, as a public good. And um, yeah, also in my city, I think it's it's a mix of uh, debates and mix of uh, tasks, but uh, I think. Our view should go to these communities uh, back from the big player, and it would be helpful in the European Parliament. So <laughs> and now I give you the floor <laughs> to the last words, uh, Molly. Great. Um, yes, thank you very much. Yes, we, we're currently in the situation where the Renewable Energy Directive needs to be put into national law, um, and some many countries are slow with it. But Germany is in a special case where they claim they have already done it, which is patently not the case. Um, so also to answer the question, what can be done at European level? Quite a lot has been done at European level in the in the Renewable Energy Directive, which um, mandates national governments to um, allow vulnerable customers to participate in community energy projects. So Brussels has kind of done their work. It's up to the national governments now to implement it. Um, but yeah, then we go back to the national level for, for ongoing work. I would wrap it up there. I would um, thank especially Bob and Takis uh, for sharing the really important perspectives about what's happening. It's easy for us sitting in Brussels to uh, get a bit lost in our um, directives and regulations and so on. Um, and thank you very much, of course, to uh, Cornelia and Stefan for inviting and hosting us. And uh, I can only say, have a nice Easter. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Bye. Cool. All Thank right. you very much. And for Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank you.